Okay, we're going to talk about non-competitive inhibition, two types. There's pure and there's mixed. And now what we have here is an enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. So this uh, white part represents my enzyme, and this uh, darker golden part represents my substrate, and this lighter yellow represents my inhibitor. And so uh, what you can see here is that the inhibitor in a pure non-competitive inhibition, the inhibitor doesn't prevent the substrate from binding at all. Um, as a matter of fact, the only thing it does is it prevents the enzyme from acting. So, for example, let's imagine that this inhibitor were to, to go away, then, then the, the enzyme may act like um, it may close up that gap that, that was there in order to squeeze the substrate breaking it off into, let's draw it to the right color, breaking it off into two different pieces, and then it would go back into its normal conformation. That would be one example of, a, of an enzyme that could, be, um, that could have pure non-competitive inhibition. So the thing to point out is that in this situation, you can have enzyme that's free, you can have enzyme with substrate, you can have enzyme with inhibitor, and you can have an inhibitor enzyme substrate complex. So let's talk about the inhibitor really fast. So in, in this situation, you could have an enzyme plus an inhibitor that could react in two directions to make an enzyme inhibitor complex, or you could have an enzyme substrate to react with an inhibitor to form an, enz an in inhibitor enzyme substrate complex. So the inhibitor can bind to the enzyme or can bind to the enzyme substrate complex. In the first case, we're going to call this uh, we're going to call this K3 the binding and K minus three the um, the unbinding. And it, then we'll call this one K3 prime and this one K minus three prime. In both cases, the substrate does not inhibit the inhibitor, and the inhibitor does not inhibit the substrate from binding. They can both freely bind regardless of the position of the other one. So just like we did with regular enzyme kinetics, we, we defined the, a constant that would describe how well the enzyme would bind to the, to the, the substrates. And we said that it is equal to K2 plus K minus 1 over K1, which we said was the Michaelis constant. And again, in this situation, we're going to define how well the inhibitor can bind to the, the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex. So the inhibitor uh, binding to the enzyme would be K minus 3 over K3. So we don't have to worry about accounting for disassociation towards products because it doesn't make any products. For example, the K2 is disassociation of the enzyme substrate complex towards products, while K minus 1 is disassociation towards substrate and enzyme. And so we're going to call this this Ki. And then, of course, we're going to call uh, the, the formation of, of enzyme, the inhibitor with the enzyme substrate complex, we're going to call that K K. Let me rewrite this, Ki prime. Now, because uh, neither the the substrate nor the inhibitor affects the other one's ability to bind, we can say that Ki for a pure non-competitive inhibit inhibitor is equal to Ki prime. So, since the binding of the inhibitor cannot affect the binding of the substrate with the enzyme. Km cannot be changed in this uh, type of inhibition. So the, the binding constant of the enzyme substrate complex cannot be changed. So Km stays the same. However, because the enzyme or the because the inhibitor is binding to a site other than the active site of the enzyme, the substrate can't outcompete it. So you will never have the same Vmax. Your Vmax will change. And so in pure non-competitive inhibition, uh, what you get is you get um, a graph that looks something like this. If we graph on a Linn-Weaver-Burke double reciprocal, this would be 1 over the velocity, and this would be 1 over the substrate concentration. And we would get a graph, so without inhibitor, let's say our graph looks like this. This is 
this is minus inhibitor. And then we would get, uh, if we added inhibitor, we would get a graph that looks like this. So this is with inhibitor. That's supposed to be a plus sign. Now if you remember right, the y-intercept, the y-intercept is equal to 1 over v max. So the higher you go on the y-intercept, the lower v max actually is. So you're actually decreasing v max with an inhibitor. However, your binding constant, uh, if you remember the x-intercept is equal to negative 1 over k over km, it doesn't change, which is what we just what we would expect if the inhibitor does not affect the ability of the enzyme to bind. Now this pure non-competitive inhibition is very rare, very rare. And what we usually see with non-competitive inhibition is called mixed non-competitive inhibition. And this is a situation where where binding where the enzyme binding with I will affect it will affect it will affect the enzyme binding with the substrate. So in this case, Ki does not equal Ki prime. And now so if the enzyme can affect the inhibitor or if the if the inhibitor can affect the substrate's binding, then it, it it's not a, a very large leap to say that the substrate will also affect the inhibitor's binding. And so depending on which way Ki goes, we could get a graph uh, that looks on a Weaver burke double reciprocal. We could get a graph that looks like this where this is without enzyme and this is with enzyme. And you'll notice that both Vmax and Km have changed in this situation. So whenever the enzyme inhibitor complex can affect the binding of the substrate or vice versa, the substrate affects the binding of the inhibitor, then you get, uh, you get a change in both Vmax and Km. In this situation where I, that I drew, uh, this situation is a situation where Ki is greater than Ki than Ki prime. You could also get a situation where you had um, something like this. So depending on where the two lines intersect, uh, will tell you how, uh, relative what is relatively larger, Ki or Ki prime. In this situation that I just drew down here, Ki is less than Ki prime. So this is a little bit confusing, but if you remember, Ki represents the, the, the disassociation divided by the association constants. And so if Ki, if Ki is greater, that means that, that actually the association of the enzyme with, with the inhibitor is lower whenever there's no substrate attached. So we're saying that when substrate, in this situation, when substrate is attached to the enzyme, the inhibitor binds better. However, when the inhibitor is bound to the enzyme, the substrate, uh, is it binds less easier. It, it, it binds or dissociates much easier than it binds. And so Km increases in this situation. And the opposite occurs down here where the, the inhibitor binds to the enzyme better without any substrate on it. So the last thing we're going to talk about with inhibitors is uncompetitive inhibition. Uh, different from non-competitive inhibition in that the inhibitor cannot bind unless the substrate is already bound to the enzyme. So substrate gets bound, inhibitor is then able to bind and stop the reaction. So at the point that the substrate binds, one of two things can happen. It can either go to products or it can go to being frozen by an inhibitor. And so if you notice, we whenever we write this out, E plus S yields... E S, and, and so we we have K one and K minus one. Neither one of these things are affected. Neither K one nor K minus one is affected. Uh, then we go to uh, actually um, two possible pathways. We can go to um, E plus P, or we can go to I E S.
or ESI as the, as the photo has it, but the textbook that I use has IES. Now enzyme to product, uh, if you remember, we call that K2. And so out of all of these rate constants, the only rate constant that sh that's affected is K2. And so uh, anywhere K2 would show up in our equations, there would be an effect. So if, we, if you remember right, the, the V max is equal to the total enzyme times K2. And if you remember, the Michaelis constant is equal to K, uh, K minus 1 plus K2 over K1. And so both the Vmax and the Michaelis constant will be changed. But uh, the other thing we have to think about is, is how they'll be changed. Because ET no longer describes e, uh, Vmax. And here's why. Whenever you have an uncompetitive inhibitor present, ET, ET is equal to the enzyme plus the enzyme substrate complex plus the inhibitor enzyme substrate complex. And so if you're trying to figure out what Vmax will be, the inhibitor enzyme substrate complex doesn't contribute to that. So you can either write ET minus IES, ET minus IES times K2, or you can write E plus ES, E plus ES times, times K2. Either one of these equations would work to, to describe the formation of product under, uh, under infinite amounts of substrate, so under Vmax conditions. And so the point I'm making here is that Km gets altered by uh, proportionately with K2, but Vmax gets altered uh, on uh, the enzyme, the total enzyme, and with K2. And so what happens is you actually get a slope that's, that is, uh, that's parallel. You get two lines that are parallel. So just like I said, uh, v, v max, which is represented, and let me change this color, is represented right here on the y intercept, is altered in the presence of an uncompetitive inhibitor. And Km is also altered because K2 has changed. But the other thing is that these lines are parallel, that, that the slope, the value of Km over V max, has changed proportion, Km and Vmax have changed proportionately with each other, and so that the lines, uh, the slope stays the same. 